Hello guys, welcome back to a watercolor tutorial. Today we're doing a sort of like a surrealist watercolor portrait. I have a bunch of fun making this and I'm sure that you'll like it too. First things first, we're actually using watercolor pencils. I'm marking everything, kind of just outlining already with whatever I created with the pencil and I am also slightly coloring with the watercolor pencil some of the details that I think that I'll have to go a little further with with them and uh, like the eyes the nose also the mouth I thought that you know it would be a good idea on starting it off with watercolor pencils I don't do this often with all of the paintings but sometimes a little help doesn't help and uh, I think that my main concern was to actually have uh, some space for the watercolor as to the light or the white part of the paper, which I think that is kind of difficult if you don't mark it down. So the watercolor pencil actually just saves me a lot of time. This video is actually pretty long, even though I kind of just squeezed as much and I also try my best to uh, speed it up because it is a very long 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 demo I actually did this on Periscope and um, I didn't meant to show all of the brushes I actually used like two brushes uh, out of the pack that I got it's just a tiny brush and a medium round brush and I also used a map what I would call a map brush almost like a map brush for watercolors just to map out um, the bigger sections of the painting I actually tried to zoom in as much as I could and it was difficult because you know I do this through the app on uh, Periscope so sometimes you know my phone is ringing if my phone is not ringing the other phone is actually out of focus so I try my best to zoom in so people can see the details. What I'm doing right now is actually going with the brush and everything that I went through with the watercolor pencil. I'm kind of just uh, giving it a little quick wash so I can uh, start off with adding the rest of the colors. I do this throughout the whole painting, everything that I need, uh, a little bit of detail, you know, and like that, it also helps me because, you know, if you have your, if your pencil drawing is done correctly, or at least similar to what you're making, you know, that your painting could be a success. And I think because, um, I feel like the drawing of a painting is actually like almost like the skeleton of what you're constructing. So as long as the sketch is actually working out for you, and is looking out perfect or correctly not perfection perfection is not what we're looking for but at least somewhat um approved by you then you know that you know that the painting could be a success um i also added a bird on her eye and it was something that you know i kind of just went out of my comfort zone but i wanted to do something different you know i like to kind of just sometimes i like to incorporate flowers and women I think it's actually a really cool combination and I thought that this was perfect to add with the watercolor for this other uh, area I actually for her lips um, if I'm not correctly because uh, this is a life demo I actually added a little bit a hint of that pink and then I thought you know why not just use it in watercolors because I think I have that color around there was a lot of color that I actually used and I'm going to possibly just give you a few of them. I have them right here as we speak on my palette. I use a butcher's palette for like the um, tubes of watercolor and then I use my regular pan watercolors. I use Koi but you can use whatever you have in hand. The paper that I'm using for this painting is Canson 98 pounds. Um, I didn't know that this paper is so versatile. I really like this paper and I definitely recommend it. These are like my practice sketches slash paintings. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm practicing for my acrylics or my oils 
when the time comes and so I'm really really having fun so what I did is that with the same uh, same technique basically just going around and outlining and adding a little bit more of that waxy color of the watercolor pencil around there just to mark my magnolias because I love magnolias it's my favorite it's one of my favorites I have a bunch but it's one of my favorite flowers as well as the goldfinch that we're adding onto the paper you know I wanted to create this demo a little more um, type of like I'm just gonna give them out what I did with the you know what I did with the with the painting alone and not do the demo actually drawing it um, and the reason why I decided to do the whole thing and just give you everything is because when you're using pictures, um, you have a thing that is called artistic license. And what you do is that you can change, you can mix match, you can twist things, and you can do all kinds of things for your painting to actually work for you. So what I did is the, the magnolias were going towards the left side. They were facing left side, and I did and I switched everything to the right. Um, I also switched part of the bird. Um, I didn't want it to do like a complete bird. Uh, of the head of the bird, I kind of just twist it to the side and instead of her eye being on its place I actually did the birds and it's kind of like a very surrealistic painting, but it actually worked out and so that's what I was doing So I was actually explaining to some of the people that were in Periscope at the moment that I feel in my humble opinion I don't want the painting police to come after me in my humble opinion when an artist is able to capture light and shadow I think that's when they realize or when you realize as an artist as much as you practice is that you kind of just you kind of just get it so um, I was actually watching a a um, someone that is actually she's a makeup artist had nothing to do with painting but the way she was describing um, light was very it's very similar that I can actually just picked up on that and I say you know what it's exactly what the way we see so light basically is what your eye is exposing to you know that bright area that is exposed and what it does is basically just expand and that's what you see if you really squint your eyes you'll be able to see light better and uh, I feel like a lot of the good, good um, painters out there are really good, good squinters. And that's how you basically just also just capture your shadow and your light. And obviously, sometimes there's like an obvious light that you can actually miss it. Working with pictures is actually a pleasure. I love to work with pictures. I go on Instagram or I go on to Pixabay and I gather my everything that I need for a painting. But I always, always suggest specifically for the um, anatomy of her portraits to start practicing on your own with your own face or with someone of your family. You know, go, go and get guinea pigs out of uh, everywhere. You can find them because that's the easiest way for you to learn. I actually took a little bit of anatomy and uh, it's pretty interesting. And uh, after I kind of just got it, I practiced a lot. I practiced drawing artists and I practiced drawing different things. After I got it a lot, I said, okay, so once you get the concept of it, and you get the light and shadow that you understand that the bone structure, where is the bone structure, etc., etc., and uh, where to follow like the cartilage and where is muscle, etc., then you kind of just uh, implement it on your own knowledge as when you're painting. So you have to have a little bit of knowledge. I don't think someone that doesn't know any painting, of course, unless you're actually copying from uh, an actual picture, then you won't be able to get um, basically the features correctly. But so I will always suggest. To people that want to start off to doing portraits or painting in watercolor to actually get themselves a handbook about anatomy or something at least to know the basics of it and so i started actually um now that we're uh back on the painting but i needed to actually explain this is that um to what i did the same thing that i did with the pencil with uh, her face i actually did with um the magnolias and i kind of just went around you know, I'm using a phone on landscape mode, and for some reason, it captured it that way. I'm not that happy about it, but I'm not that mad at it. Um, eventually, as much as I want to, I want to really get, I think it's an M50. 
It's a Canon M50, and it's one of those flip camera phone, uh, flip cameras where you can actually see yourself. I think that a lot of uh, bloggers use it, and I was actually watching someone doing a demonstration on these cameras, and I think uh, that's basically what I want. But these cameras are actually pretty expensive. I know they're going to like. I I feel like you know, Mary. You spend money on makeup, you spend money on this. Why not on a actually good camera so you can do your YouTube videos? Um, I think on the near future, hopefully, I can get a hands-on. I actually have a camera that I use, but um, it's not like the greatest. I'm a bit upset. It, it actually, and, and, the, and the funny part is that it actually cost me $200. And uh, so it's not that cheap. So I guess $200, more, $200 plus $400 more. And I can get my M50 and start doing my videos. So for now, uh, please excuse my M, my, not my M, but my um, crappy phone. But that's what we have. And that's how I do actually these videos or these demos. Um, I don't like also that when I'm transferring the video from Periscope to my app that I use to transfer my videos from Periscope to YouTube that they kind of just make this weird phone like shape and so hopefully you know i can correct that when it comes to the when i get the camera so basically everything that i did was just um this is the reason why i'm like talking about other things is just basically outline everything and just rubbing around with alcohol oh, i'm sorry with alcohol god with water and what i see now is what i'm doing now is that i, I went with the bluest or a light blue and I went around and I did that to the whole um, entire background and I painted it blue and I also painted part of her hair blue which uh, we're going to explain later on as to what happened with her hair and how I created her hair um, I think that when you're creating something like this, you're really not thinking about how it's going to, or the outcome, you're just doing it. You know, I'm always, uh, I have a full-time job, so I have to work. I don't have time to sit down and prepare a painting. So it's basically very spontaneous. So we're basically just working out the sketch and the, and the colors at the same time. So after a few, I go all over around just adding that light blue. And I did this in a very uh, different way. Some parts have went into wet, a lot of dry into wet. I try my best. Actually, like you see here, I'm actually just using a matte brush and I'm adding some yellow, uh, I'm sorry, some sepia color like that, very light. And this is going to be my ground for my hair. So we're actually, I'm, I'm doing a, a yellow finch. I know it's not like a very common bird in, in paintings, um, which I think that a yellow finch is actually a very happy, very mellow um, bird to me. So it's really not um, synonymous of, um, I don't think this painting is synonymous of any sadness or anything. Um, but I did, did it on her eye. And instead of picturing her eye like looking at you, I actually did the bird's eye looking at the viewer, which is kind of like a Dali type of sur surreal. Um, I got inspired by Dali, um, the master of surrealism, and I love his paintings. I love the way he created, 
you know, all these beautiful, uh, very surrealistic, very almost no-nonsense painting. And I think he was a genius on his own right. So doing something like this is definitely kind of like a homage to Dali. So what you see me here is when it comes to birds or any other creature out there that I could think of when it has this really bright yellow, you have to have like the Atchison color to it. I thought that that bright sepia or like that brown lightish brown sepia will actually help me. I also have a rule when it comes to black, you know, black can be a little bit, you know, kind of flat in watercolors. So what I do with the black is that I always mix it in with a different color. It just gives me this vibrant, more, you know, more hippity hop, uh, in other words, kind of like a, a more interesting black than rather just a flat black color so what i do is that i mix it i mix it with other colors so my sepia in this case is actually just making ground for that black color that is going to be posted later on on top of that um, of the feathers of the bird so this work of art um i wanted also to do it with the pants of watercolor which is the koi watercolors and then I realized that after the koi watercolor, some of the mixing that I had to do on my painting wasn't going to work. So I had to go and get my actual uh, tubes of watercolor. So this painting has a bunch of things in it. It has like the pen, watercolor pencils and uh, it has gouache as well. And also the watercolor pens, watercolor in tubes and i created this with like kind of like a layer by layer by layer until i got everything kind of just together i use uh, pictures like i said from pixabay and you can do the same thing and i use my license to kind of just change everything everywhere um again and i just kind of just mix match it to create something unique and at the same time to create Something that it will look good on a piece of paper. So now what you see me doing is actually, I'm actually doing the washes for the magnolia. And I also kind of just locked in my shadow. I think that's very, very important. And that's with every painting. You can uh, lock in your, uh, your shadow and uh, that will help you to create your painting even better. I feel like always, not that I do it for almost every, uh, every time in my paintings, but I lock in my shadow and I lock in my lights, specifically for watercolors because I feel like it's easier. So I'm just going to be working with my background color. And uh, for this, I use, like I said, some parts where I use some wet into wet um, and some drying to wet around my painting and the way I did the magnolias was basically went into it. Magnolias are almost like a transparent white and it has this very, very pastel, very easy light pink on them. So you don't want to overcrowd them by making them too dark or too light. So that's what I did. I did them wet into it. And then I kept on adding more layers as I continue moving on around the painting. This painting has a lot of detail that can actually kind of overwhelm anybody. And it lasted about two hours and a half or so to create the whole thing. I was painting since I think 11 or so. So 11 all the way until three o'clock. I really don't know how far or how many hours is that, but that's how I created this work. If you don't want to just complicate your life creating so many details or so many things in your paintings you can just go ahead and do your regular portrait i think it's easier to do just regular portraits but like i said i wanted to do something different and i think this is like the perfect time i was off from work and uh, at the same time i haven't been able to create anything for a while so i thought you know a perfect day then actually sit down I wasn't expecting to create something surreal or anything. I just sat down and I say, you know what? I got to do something. I got to do something painting related. And so I started doing that. What you see me doing now, even though I did paint it over the bird, is that like I get some clear water and I kind of just rub around or map around my the areas 
even though you're gonna see some light shining through it's actually being painted I do this as to not leave some white of the paper unless it's absolutely necessary we're going to go in and I actually I love periscope because of that it allows me to zoom in and out uh, my regular phone, you know, it's all crappy and stuff. We're, we're not going to be mad at it because at least I'm able to do this. It doesn't let me, it doesn't allow me, the video feature doesn't allow me to zoom in to my work. So I wanted to really zoom in so people can actually see how I'm doing this and what I'm doing this while um, the painting is, or I'm painting. So... Here is when I actually finished using the pan watercolors and I started layering some of my tubes in watercolors. And so um, I know this is going to be kind of fast. So I use a black sepia, burnt amber, crimson red. Uh, uh, this one is like a sunnelier pink or sunnelier red. I actually use Indian red and some yellow this is very bright yellow this is from Holbein I also use some green and I created this um, what else am I missing everything or oh, of course some blue I use blue for and this is specifically all the colors that you see there are specifically um, all organized to create the face create the portrait itself um the model itself she has this rosy pink on it and is uh also like this almost like a coffee and cream complexion it's very she's very actually she's very 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 beautiful and i thought on also just giving her that part she's also i don't know how old she is but she seems very young so i always wanted to do that um kind of like a fresh tone in her skin tone so i added some of that sennelier red or uh, pink that almost is like an a uh, pink opera if you have another brand I uh, and started doing this by kind of just switching the green color on the side yellow color everything that kind of just belong together I kind of just mix it in because I use a butcher's palette uh, or palette in the butcher's palette if you're if you use a lot of water kind of just everything kind of just goes into a corner and a lot of people don't like to use them but these are the cheapest palette in the world the good thing about these palettes is that you can just reuse them you pour a little bit of water with soap and you can use them with acrylics as well as with watercolors and i think this is like the best invention ever if i don't want to create a mess with the acrylics and i don't want to go through the hassle of actually cleaning the acrylics what i do is that i get an aluminum foil and i post it or i place it on top of my my palette or my butcher's palette and I add all the colors in there and I just start creating with that so what you see me here is actually I explain to people every single color that I use one by one and if you can't because this video is kind of too fast you can definitely go to Periscope and I'm going to get and give you the link as to where the full demo um, it is and you can see the full painting um, is slower so you'll be able to understand a little bit more. And I think that's also a good thing if you want to learn to do portraits like these. So what you see here is that I'm trying to explain to people, you know, I'm going to omit some of the areas here. And I, I actually don't use the um, masking fluid. I don't mask anything. So it has to be with a little bit of the, like the detail brush. 
I try my best not to go around it. Um, this painting was kind of weird for me because I actually leave the details for last, last, last. And I kind of just started over like weird. Um, I just wanted to be as fast as I could with the artwork. Um, and so I started doing details rather than the full face. But you're going to see how actually I constructed almost everything. Um, I think that... Uh, if I were to just start it without people seeing me, it would be like the whole face first and then I will do the flowers and then I will do the bird and then I will finish with the hair and then I will do the details of the eyes, etc, etc. So I kind of just did everything kind of like out of place, nothing in a specifically in a specific order. And uh, it was cool. It was OK. You know, I really liked it. Uh, what you see here is that I actually use Artessa. And uh, I try to use this color here that you see me pulling out. But when I looked at it, it was almost like a, it's like a it's sepia. It's not actually the color that I wanted. I wanted a green, uh, arm, almost like an army green tone. And I couldn't find it. So here it is, the green that I was talking about. And this is from Holbein. And I'm showing it to the camera. It's almost like a green... Uh, mixed with a sepia type of uh, color and it's actually from Holbein and I use it a lot in uh, in my flowers and flower paintings but in this case this color is primarily for the portrait it needed that green tone like I said she has this rosy kind of like a coffee and milk type of skin tone with um, in her but there's some green undertones that if you don't if you don't really look at her you really won't be able to grasp on them but she does have it here i am actually showing you how i did my wash and i always like to do this because like that you can see the color of the skin on the actual palette as you as we're speaking so all the colors that i put in together including a hint of that black right there is on the skin tone and it helps you to develop also an eye for skin and it develops an eye to create um, different parts of the body and uh, of course you know if you have already that wash with you well, all you got to do is add either a little bit of blue a little bit of sepia and you create the shadow of that same skin tone so it's easier when you get a grasp onto the colors that you need for skin tone I think that was the most difficult part for me in the beginning because I didn't know like how do you know the undertones of a human being like how do you know this person has yellow in them and um, I don't know if it was my art teacher back in the day or I actually just read it somewhere or I saw it online I started seeing skin like sand so if you go to the beach and you grab a bunch of sand in your hand you see the sand is different colors there's some brown there's some dark there's some uh, white there's some uh, green there's some blue there's so many minerals in it and so the same way it's skin skin tones have all kinds of colors in them and then okay so I, I got the part of our skin tone that now what can I do about um, perhaps like the light part of the skin. So I always like uh, refer to light as to always like if you if you were looking at a window, you put your hand through it and you see that reflection that the light does when it's going through your hand. That's how basically you can understand how light works in a skin tone. And so once you grab that, and I don't know if I'm making myself uh, understandable and I hope I do once you grasp that uh, grasp that I think that is easier for you to understand how undertones and skin tones work I think that this method a lot of makeup artists use it when they're doing their own makeup formulas on how people have these blue undertones in them those purple undertones or even those um, for me it will be like a painter type it will be some uh, sepia undertone in them. So all those yellow undertones, green undertones, um, there's so many, so many undertones in skin, uh, as well as different types of, like some, per some, some people might have some yellow in them and some people have yellow and a little bit of greenish in them. So, um, but like I said, you have to look at color in a way of like the same way you see sand with different, different, different types of color in them 
different types of um, sepias, different types of burnt amber, light, light, darker, you know, all that stuff plays, goes into place. So I was actually explaining on Periscope and I would like to kind of just rephrase it here. Is that, like I said, I'm marking and the first thing that you see me marking and I do this with almost everything is my shadow and I'm not afraid of marking my shadow and at this technique you can actually use it for your acrylics and you can use it for your oils I think it makes it easier for you to see okay so once I have my shadow then I can create my form and then from there I can take it so on so on so on until you get to your lights in oils and into watercolors i do the same thing i mark my shadows right away i know that underneath like her neck area it was kind of tricky she has a big um she has a big gap where her, her uh collarbone is and i didn't want to make it too obvious um so i what i did was that i kind of just um, did i did the light the light part of it but I didn't want to make it too obvious. So I make it as light and as, as uh, I guess as soft as I could in the painting. And I think that it worked out and that's what you see me. I usually, when I'm doing a portrait, I usually just do the portrait without caring about the body, but I thought it was just um, a way of, I don't know, like it, it looked more complete with doing part of the body and just doing the whole portrait, just the neck and the, and the face. So I created also her shoulders and her neck area. Now you see me that I'm actually just putting in a uh, part of like the part where the bird is. Well, I think that was the most difficult part, but we're going to go into details later on. So for the nose, again, this is cartilage. What's underneath is just basically a hole. That's for every human being. And so I added a bit more to the same wash that I was uh, using. I was I added a little bit more pink and that's how I created the nose and of course you know the good thing was that the picture of the model that I'm using or the model that I use uh, she has this pronounced uh, highlight right on her nose and I don't know if it was on purpose but you know some of these girls are masters at taking pictures of her of themselves so I think that that was perfect for me in the case of the painting because I was able to kind of just get that light out of my way without no worries um i drag the same color and i and i grab it around i usually get a lot of questions about how many layers does it take like to get the painting done and i always say between three and four layers a lot of people don't believe in this they say ah oh, what if you need 10 what if you need 11 and you're telling them four but um, so far, almost in every painting, I take between three and four layers. So this will be my first layer. And as you can tell, I'm not doing it in a, a graduated, granulated, or I'm not doing in a gradual way. I'm just applying paint. The brush is wet, so I'm able to kind of just surround the whole area easier. So I'm just basically just mopping out that wash. And at the same time, I'm locking in my shadow. And I paint everything in this case i paint the whole face and uh, of course where i saw the dark where i saw dark where i saw shadow i created the shadow what you see me here or what you see me doing here is basically just jotting down where the light is for her lips i think that's a big deal for me i like the details i like people to see um shine through light i you know like i said i'm a bit obsessed with the topic of light because i think that was the most difficult part of me learning how to do these things and uh, for someone that has more experience i think that they already know that that's what we actually aim for light and shadow is very important i know perspective is also very important if you're doing landscape etc etc and for us you know if you're doing something like that like a portrait i think that that's also part of you know creating a human being and what you see me here is also following and i was actually explaining and i'm going to explain over here that always the um, upper lip is going to be darker than the under lip that's sort of like a anatomy rule kind of sort of portrait rule whatever you want to call it is because of the shadow the the under oh the under lip right i'm just not you know trying myself to be as technical as possible so the upper the upper lip is casting or the the one in the bottom the bottom lip is casting the shadow on the top part of the lip so you will always have that dark 
dark upper lip and the light upper um oh my god now i'm confusing myself but you get it the bottom part was always be light and the on the top part will always be dark same thing you have shadow underneath your nose now when i was started doing portraits this was very very difficult to understand like how much shadow do i actually i've seen artists really like dipping in a brush and really digging in and dripping that underneath the nose with a lot of dark skin tone or a lot of dark uh shadow and i learned that in order for you to kind of just cast a nice shadow of her nose of the nose has to be in a way a very delicate way women are you know everything is kind of like more softer than men so every single like the chin area very delicate um uh, almost almost like very very thin layers went under there the same thing goes for her nose underneath her nose the shadow cast it from her nose it was very delicate so you don't have someone with a lot of strong features if it was a guy if it was a male then i'll do that shadow a little bit more darker i will sharpen those jaws of course and i will do it more like you know almost like more masculine so that was the part that i think that nobody explained in their videos and i couldn't grab it from anywhere so this is basically This is basically learned for experience. So those shadows underneath her chin, the shadows also on her lip area are very, very delicate. Almost like I did washes over washes until I got it. Now what you see me doing here is just basically applying the last, last uh, shadow uh, or cast shadow or whatever dark color that you might find. I do a mix of blue and black. Again, it has a sepia underneath. And then I'm doing that blue. And it creates this really rich, almost like translucent black with a hint of blue that you'll be able to see. You can't see it from here right now. But on the picture, you'll be able to see it. And if you go to my Twitter, you'll be able to see it on the painting as well. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just creating the bird's feathers, which is a different way of doing details, of course. And uh, maybe one day I'll be able to do a bird painting so you can understand a little bit about more of the detail of the feather. I think that adding the sepia underneath, specifically for this bird, not for everything, but for this bird, allows me to see the light of the feathers as well. And uh, I actually helped myself with some uh, gouache. So I wasn't too worried about going going over the lights, the lights of or the whites of the bird's feathers. So I kind of just did, you know, what I had to do with the dark color. And then I went back to the with the wash and I redid the bird. And this bird, like I said, I kind of just twisted the head a little bit and I play around with it. And uh, it's in a really uncomfortable spot for this model, but I wanted to do it. Uh, that way actually just a uh, very cool way I actually did the little legs grabbing onto her eye and I kind of just love the way it came out and uh, we're just gonna move on to after the bird we're gonna move on around the area around this around the whole um, painting uh, the crest the same way you know i kind of just exaggerated everything wash helped me a whole lot the beak was giving me a bit of difficulty because every single bird that i saw on pictures they just being sideways none of them are actually frontal i don't know i couldn't find it i didn't have the patience to go through pixabay and choose my pictures i just chose whatever was closer so i was um it gave me a little bit of difficulty but right after i found a a um a picture I just did and whatever I finished it with the gouache and it actually helped me with the bird as you can see here so I actually finished the bird earlier than anything because I uh, like I said I was I didn't want this to, to to take forever even though it's a pretty lengthy demo
I think for any uh, picture that you may think, I think it's difficult because it's covering the eye. Where does the eye start and where does it end? Well, just to give you like an idea, you always have an eye space between your nose and the uh, other eye. So if you were to look at yourself, there's always the same space between your nose and the t or two eyes. That's for almost every human being, unless you're you have some type of condition or I don't know, you weren't made that way. But most of us have an eye uh, length between our nose and the two eyes that we have. And uh, that's how I kind of just measure where the eye was going to start. And uh, I, on this case, I kind of just went a little bit with the details on her eyebrows. I'm not crazy about doing details on eyebrows. And uh, there's a reason to that, but I kind of just broke the rule when it came to this one. And I started them off with a little bit of black color and then I added the sepia later on. But you see me doing her eyebrow. I noticed too that she takes very good care of her eyebrow. So I wanted to just give that a really nice uh, detail. Again, I'm going underneath the nose and I use this sort of like a sepia with a hint of any color that is darker for her uh, shadow. The nose, everything, specifically the nose, is something that, oh my goodness, I hated to do them. I didn't know how to really create that cast a shadow. A lot of people ask and I heard and read the shadow of the nose, the casting of the, you know, those nostrils, you have to learn how to do that. And blah, blah, blah. Same thing with the mouth. It was very, very difficult. So what I will suggest you to do is that start slow. Don't, uh, don't rush yourself into creating the shadow underneath the nose. Just start slow. If you have to go around, just do it. And then you come and you do like one layer and then a little bit darker until you get to what you want. Because it could be a bit frustrating creating noses. Believe me, I, I tried a, a whole lot. Now I did create the mouth with a little bit more darker of the same shadow color that I used for the nose. And this is just my preference. You really don't have to. A lot of people say, oh, the cast shadow of the mouth is about the same as what you have inside which is your tongue and your tongue is red so you have to cast a shadow which is purple i say cast a shadow uh the way you want to it really doesn't matter i think that that's just you know sometimes the rules of what a color or painting or whatever i think that whatever works for you is fine so i think uh um again like you see I'm actually adding more shadow to my nose or to her nose and I'm leaving it alone and then I go back and I add more shadow to different areas and that is my dear husband bothering me. So now we're going in for the lips. Now, in this case, and I'm glad that she didn't have no makeup on and I really didn't have to bother with that. I wanted also to do a painting or the color of the lips as closer as possible to, um, as natural as possible. So what I did is that, and also for the flowers, because remember I'm doing this um, no, magnolias and magnolias like I said is are almost like very delicate so that's what I actually did I started off the magnolias with um, that wash watercolor pencil and after that I added a little bit more of the detail with that really pinkish color and I went all over just adding details until I got basically the painting almost done at the same time which is not easy to do but it is possible as you can see here on the example that's what we're doing and uh, we created everything at the same time you know a painting like this i feel like for someone else 
to create it. It takes way much time. Uh, this is not a small painting. This is a 12 by 16. And like I said, a lot of details. So two hours and a half basically means nothing compared to the amount of detail that the painting actually has. So I try my best to do as fast as I could as I'm actually explaining some of my viewers how to do this. And uh, it brings me a lot of pleasure. I always tell people, hey, you know what? Use, use it. Go ahead. Use it. I don't care. Do what you got to do. Learn from me. Learn everything that I give you. You know, this is free for your use. So I say the same thing. If you learn something from what you watch or from what you see, it brings me a lot of pleasure. I have a lot of dreams when it comes to my work and my art. But for now, you know, I'm just doing what I can with the work that I do. I love to create and I think that I'm more focused towards the creating part than actually anything else for the moment. Like I said, I do have a full-time job, which makes it very difficult sometimes to concentrate in work or in art in general. So I, I'm just creating, I'm just adding and just doing and just, uh, you know, just try my best to grasp onto any subject out there. I love to make I love to make almost everything, but for me, you know, this this is this is for me one of my favorites, which is portraits. They're not easy, but you know, they can be managed as long as you have like the basics. I think. I always tell people, practice makes it better. You have to practice for everything. As long as you practice, I think that you become better, and you really don't have to be a know-it-all or a uh, master painter to know the basics of painting. I think that does creates some patience. I heard a lot of people saying, if you put into, I don't know, certain amount of hours, then you create kind of like you become this and you become that. And I'll say for art, art you, it's like you expand your knowledge every single minute, every single moment. I don't think up to this day, and I have more than 10 years painting, I can tell or I can say, Oh yeah, I, I am this master painter. I really can tell and I can say that. If I say that, you know, I'm wrong because every single day that I'm painting, I'm learning something new. And I try to incorporate it in my work as well as I'm trying to explain to people how I got to this point and what did I do. It was a lot of trial and error. So I think that the best way is actually just to practice and then the rest will come, you know, just, just have to be patient. Patient, I'm sorry. What you see here is actually the stem of the magnolia. These stems are darker. And so what I did is that I started them with a yellow tone. And then I end up with a very dark blue. And then after that, I, add, I added a black tone to it. And so they have this very nice contrast in them. Also wanted to explain something about botanical art or botanical or flowers in general. You really have to know that every single subject, including flowers, do have their own light into them. So even though if you're using a picture and the picture doesn't show you that this, this um, flower does have a light in them, you kind of already know because um, I practice a lot with uh, a lot of flowers, a lot of pictures, a lot of uh, still lives, a lot of... I love magnolias. That's one of my favorite flowers. And so even though I, I, I think that my favorite of them all is actually parrot tulips. If you get a chance, you can look up for parrot tulips. And I think that's one of the most beautiful flower. You know, there must be uh, out there. There's got to be a bunch um, of other beautiful flowers, but parrot tulips to me, I think is like mo one of the most, it's just very colorful, very happy flower. And they usually come out in spring. So magnolias is basically one of my, uh, go-to flowers when it comes to, because they're easier to make. It's just one, basically just one tone all over the flower, which is pink and white and a hint of yellow. Now, a lot of watercolorists, they do add some blue when they're doing white, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I, I type of, try, trying to omit that white, and instead of, I just added a, a hint of purple to it. 
So what you see here is basically the whole full picture. And then I am uh, kind of just uh, underlining and also um, kind of just separating her body from the background. So the bottom part is kind of just like bottom part is a little bit more darker than the top. And so that's what you see me doing here. And kind of just, uh, I kind of separate everything from the background and I'm lifting up as you see, not lifting up the paint, but I'm just getting rid of everything as you see with the background color, which is that light blue or dark blue, better say. And then, of course, you know, I did all kinds of stuff to the painting, but we're just going to focus now on the background. So that's what you see and just basically just getting everything out of the way. One thing about watercolors that I did learn and that I would like for you to practice as well or to get into, I guess, just to make it a note is that I feel like when you really put down a really dark color into next to a really light or the brightest light next to the really dark, dark, dark background or dark color, because obviously the light expands, it just creates this beautiful, beautiful contrast. So always, I feel like not all the time, not necessarily some watercolors don't have to do it. I do it. I love to paint with backgrounds. Uh, and the reason why is because I feel like my painting looks more complete. It's my thing. It's my thing. After all, you know, I broke my head trying to figure out what color goes with what. So that's why I like to create backgrounds for my paintings. But it's not necessary. I've seen painters... I'm sorry. I've seen painters creating this type of work without no background whatsoever. So you don't have to. But um, there is something about sometimes the background and and also the background actually should help the painting so that's you have to take that in mind if if the background is not going to help the painting just leave the painting alone and just keep it moving unless it's a still life of course because i think that you might need some type of background color in it So what you see here is that I'm all over and I'm softening, uh, softening out. Again, I'm pouring clear as it can be and just uh, making sure that I press, uh, put down the shadow correctly. And uh, uh, I think my audio was the neck, of course. You know, there's always something. Her, her face was, is tilted. So um, the neck is something that I needed to really like get on and do it right i didn't want it to mess up so this is my second layer as you can tell i don't need a um i don't need the picture to look at the where the shadow is because i'm going basically with bone structure and that's something that you need to learn if you're practicing portraits the bone structure it will help you again uh, also i wanted to um for you to take note is that i'm actually following along with the form so my painting, my brush is going with the form. And uh, this is where I, what I was saying about implementing darker, dark against light, because it actually helps you to develop an eye for also for light. So it's actually really, really cool to create things um, that you have, uh, that you have already like a knowledge of, but you know, to know that that's how it kind of just bring up a painting by creating that dark, dark, dark against white is actually pretty cool. So now I went back and I'm swimming in because I want people to see the detail on the work. And uh, I hope that I explain myself. You know, I usually come to YouTube and when people start talking, I just get like, oh my God, can you please hop? Can you please stop? I'd rather put music on. I really, the reason why I explain things and the reason why I talk about what I create is because I want people to learn. I want people to learn how I created this. You know, there's really no use if I just do something and people, you know, something that you can do and people don't know how. I I love to create and say, hey, you know what, this is what I can do. And I do it with a lot of uh, enthusiasm and I love to do this and that and that. But I've, I've really, really appreciated when people take their time in explaining to me 
how they came to this conclusion, how they came to do this. I think, you know, it's one thing that it makes you humble and it also makes other people also do or take action and do perhaps a painting. Because if you if you don't explain or it makes it difficult for people. Some some people need to know how to create this thing because they're going to implement it in their own. So I apologize about that. But I think I was looking for something. Anyways, yeah, I was looking for that red. That red is very important because I actually use it for both the flower and I use it for her lips. And so I wanted that really orange. And also I use that red for her hair. Now her hair in her actual picture is actually black, but I wanted something different and I thought it was a good idea on just making her different. Not, you don't have to do exactly what you see. Remember, you have that artistic license that you can kind of just break things and do your own thing. At first, I just wanted to do her that way and just create her black hair and just call it a day. But I say the red against the contrast of the yellow bird will do me good, which actually did and worked out and I'm glad. Um, so you can, uh, you can add whatever you want. I just love color and I love how color reacts when it's next to each other. So that's why I created the hair with the reddish tone that you see here. And I did this um, kind of just like maybe like a, this curls going on her face. I thought it was really cute. And so I wanted her to just be at the same time a little bit more, you know, uh, I want her, I want her to look really nice. And at the same time, I changed her tone and I hope that she forgives me if she ever sees herself in this painting. But for now, um, you know, this is what I thought it was necessary to create this work. And of course, you know, I added some undertone blues and some greens, etc. around the work. So, in the beginning, when I was looking at it, I was like, oh, maybe this is not going to work. I should have added the, the red. But then, you know, the, the beginning, since the gecko, the idea was to create that hair with red, but then added some really dark undertones. So, I knew that if I did this, it wasn't going to be too obvious, because if I were to leave it red, or everything red, it was just not going to work. So what I did, even though I, as much as I love the red color, I thought, you know, I have to really darken this. And so that's what I did. And that's what you're going to see next. Um, one rule of thumb, you have to, I, I think that I, and I don't know if I ever explained that, but it's good to know that, you know, when you're creating or when you're doing uh, a painting that is, that has so many details and so, and so many you know, you see me that I move all over. You don't want you want to keep busy, so just try to try your best to move all over so you can complete your painting in less time than you if you were actually just creating. Um, like I said, it was just it's for time because it does takes quite a bit of time. So you you can definitely um, do this um, with your paintings. You can just move all over and it will actually help you to create um, to create your job and uh, I, I had a little bit of a problem you know I use a phone I use my work phone unfortunately it's actually my other phone I'm recording with this phone and I'm using the other phone to see the picture and sometimes um, it's difficult because my phone was like you know, can you delete this picture? And it was giving me a hard time. So, um, you know, I appreciate your patience as well. And so what you see me here is actually, I think I was looking at the model. I'm not sure. 
but uh, yeah i was uh trying my best to do her hair and to just create those little laps of curls that you see there and then i also created the flowers at the same time and everything else that you see there i kind of just finish it um simultaneously and it was easier for me as well because uh like you can tell it's a big painting Okay, so we're swimming in back into the bird area, and uh, I think I really like how he's just posing in there, and, and I just like the feel of it in your eye. It's kind of like, oh my god, can you possibly hold on to a bird in your eye? I don't know. Kind of weird, fluffy and cute, but at the same time, kind of like, ugh, get off me type of feeling but she seems to be enjoying it and I added a bunch of other things that you will see uh, during the picture so what I did is that I actually added also like I said I added wash and I added some highlights into the bird and it actually helped me and uh, what you see there also is that I kind of just went with the watercolor on the bottom. I went over his tail. So I had to fix that with the wash. And that's what you see me doing there. I think wash in watercolor, it should be almost like you need to do it. Like this is awesome because if you went over a highlight or you didn't finish something and it just, it helps you tremendously. So I would recommend you to get a bottle of wash, wash, wash 
I get a bottle or a tube of gouache and implement it in your paintings because it actually helps you. I used to use a lot of schminke, like the gold tone of schminke, and I think with this painting it will have gotten to a whole nother level if I used if I did that. And uh, so um, I'm going to get it myself. And the beak, I actually try my best to fix it. Adding highlights to everything, I think that was a really cool idea. And I did it uh, specifically on the bird's eyes. So, you know, her eyes is closed, the bird is in there, and the bird is actually looking at the viewer, which I thought it was a very cool and, uh, I guess, creepy way of kind of just tell, I don't know, the viewer that the bird was looking at them. And um, it, it is a very interesting painting when you look at it. So I had to take a pause. What I did is that I had to clean up. You know, if you're using wash and you're using watercolors, you can pour the water that you're using the wash with, you can pour on your watercolors or else you are going to be in trouble. So I had to clean up the little um, thing that I have for watercolors. I actually use a Tostitos Chunky Salsa Mild um, glass jar. That's what I use. It's perfect because it has a lid. So you can just uh, leave it alone and do your washes or just use it for your water, for your watercolors. And I do that with the pasta as well. I use the pasta glass for my water. All right, so what I'm doing here is adding a little bit more reddish tone and adding more shadow. You don't have to necessarily if you're going to do like dark tones like I was going to do, but I thought that it was necessary. I wanted to really do the right thing here with the hair. And uh, I also kind of just uh, wanted to see how the hair was going to look when you're adding a dark tone. So um, that's what I did there. And uh, you see me basically just really applying that again uh something that it's difficult because it was difficult for me in the beginning when i first created a piece and i didn't know how to tackle hair i think that's very difficult so i think that in this painting is sort of like a resume of everything that i've learned over the years and um again i feel like the way i create hair is by shadow and form and light everything everything has the same thing so that's what we're doing here <laughs> even though the model on the picture does not have this type of thing on her face on her head on her hair 
I kind of because I've been working with the watercolors for a while and doing portraits and doing hair, etc. I kind of already know where the hair kind of just follows. So hair shadow is where it bends. And so that's what I've been doing on the picture that you see here. For the darker tones, I think I use sepia. It's the closest color if you're using that red tone. And I actually added that red tone and a hint of black because uh, it's basically like an undertone of what I already put down, which is that red color. And I hope that I made myself understandable when it comes to color mixes. It's not an easy thing to do, to create without just um, applying and doing your own washes and your own uh, formulas. But it's just worth it. I recommend you to try your best to use one of those. Um, my goodness, I forgot the name of it. I'll get it one sec. One second. One second. Okay. It's a color wheel, color wheel. So just get yourself a color wheel and start studying it because it's important. That's, I think that's what made me understand color better and how I can mix my colors. Just a color wheel alone, it gives you three ways of what goes with what and what color. It's secondary to the other color and how they mix and match, etc., etc., etc. So I think that it's recommended that you get yourself a, a color wheel so you know how you can mix your color and i think for me my obsession as long as as far as i know is actually has been and will always be actually color because i work in a lot of flower with a lot of flowers and if you don't know how to mix and match i mean you know nature already have and is the perfect i think that great creator is the perfect artist because he does everything so perfectly but uh, when it comes to us, I feel like I needed my color wheel to understand uh, different things, you know. Flowers is something that is easier because flowers basically just have already in them that, that scheme of colors. But it actually can help you to develop not only your still lives, but your portraits and everything else with that color wheel is so very important so i will recommend you to get a color wheel and i think it's like three five dollars i don't know the last time i got a color wheel from michael's was like five bucks no less than that and uh and you study your colors and believe me this is just so you can become a better colorist when it comes to your own paintings or your own work or you kind of understand why an artist i feel like my also my big deal a big deal for me was why these artists use this color in their background? Why these artists use this uh, tone in their background? Why this, these artists use uh, this uh, undertone on her skin tone? Well, what's going on? So that's also part of knowing your secondary and your primary and your tertiary colors. And it is with a color wheel, just as simple as it sounds. So I'm going in with some details. This demo is a long, lengthy one. I was explaining people on Periscope, please don't give up on me. It is lengthy. Um, I didn't mean it to be lengthy. And I didn't want it to do like half uh, painting, half explaining this, half. And I wanted to do everything at once because, you know, I don't have the time as other people. I just have to do, this is what I came up with and this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to finish it today. That's how I work. The way I actually got and into speed, like I know how to speed my paintings or as fast as I could. Uh, what well, you see me spreading in there before I 
go on to the speed thing is um, alcohol just use it in some of the corners of the painting because I thought it was cool and um, I can live without it also so for you to pick up on speed is the same way you have to not only you have to practice and I think but um, what I did is that I time myself I time myself you know this takes 10 minutes this takes five minutes how far how fast did I did this uh, how many how many minutes do I take to do a small miniature or how many minutes do I take in doing a bird um, and so you know speedy is for painters like myself that don't have much time to sit down and to really just recollect and just collect pictures and then study and do the sketch it's just not realistic for me so I have to what I do is that I Pick, pick up my pictures. I probably pick up pictures way ahead of painting. So I go, let's say on Pinterest or I go to Pixabay or I go to Instagram and I do like a collage in my phone as to picture, paintings or pictures, mostly pictures that I can use and incorporate in my own work or inspiration per se of anything. It doesn't matter. And I have already that collection of pictures in there just because and uh, when I basically sit down to work, then I go on Pixabay and I add whatever rest, which I actually did with this particular painting. I've already had like three or four pictures of the same model. And then I had three or four pictures of another model. And I wanted to do the other one, but I thought that, I ah, why not? I always saw her face, so maybe this time I could do somebody else. And then I started doing her her face instead of the other one. And then I have gone about two weeks or two, yeah, about a week or so. And I've been just wanting to do something different. And I wanted to do birds and I wanted to do flowers and I wanted to just like, I, I want to do everything at the same time. So how can you do that? is by almost like creating that collage on your basically your phone and i took some pictures of uh like i took pictures of that uh, goldfinch i have also a chickadee which is also my favorite bird and i said you know what i'm going to combine this magnolias here with this chickadee and i think this is how i'm going to do it by the time that my actual painting or the day for painting which is today came I had only the most face and I say I already have like a, a an idea how I, I'm going to do the bird and then I had an idea of how I was going to do the magnolias because I've done magnolias pretty much almost all the time and so I sat down and I said I want to do this this I want to do and uh, I thought that you know there's got to be an inspiration behind your work and uh, you know I've been uh, back home is actually shaking the earthquake and everything and I've been very stressed with everything. You know, I call my family. My mom is over there, my brothers. And uh, I haven't had, like, I haven't had a chance to really sit down and do something. So I said, you know what? A friend of mine on Twitter actually tweet me and say, you know what? Try to relax, try to get your coffee, your breakfast together and start painting Amiga, you know, so you can relax a little bit. You know, I think that he understood the amount of stress that I was going through. And uh, I think that he's telling me that actually helped me so as soon as I got everything I got everything all the materials all the pictures I went on to periscope turn on the camera and I said today we're going to paint and it's going to be lengthy and here is the demo I want to thank you in advance for taking your time into actually watching this I know they're lengthy but I feel like if I don't cover everything or I show you everything that I do it's kind of like cheating so I like to show everything that I do how I did it, I think it's important. And uh, for people, most of it, for people to learn, okay? And no more Enda, because I've been like, la la la, Enda, Enda, Enda. You know, I, <laughs> I wasn't born here. So my secondary language is actually English. My, my primary is Spanish. So it's sometimes difficult to not do these things. So I'm trying my best to explain it in English without my translator going to sleep. So thank you so much again for watching. And if you have any questions, you're more than welcome. So what I do there is that, oh, one thing before I go on to explaining everything else, not only I'm dealing with the shadow of the eye socket, but instead of doing her 
eyes open, like the actual model, I closed her eyes. And then when I did this, I was like, what did you, why? But you know, I thought it was, it just gives her more of a pleasurable face than actually having her eyes open. You know, this is not about creating pain for her. This is more about, oh, you know what, I'm just here and I'm, she's gonna make me with flowers and, uh, you know, and her bird on my head and I'm not even gonna feel it. A uh, certain type of thing. So I, cre I created her eye closed and then I was said, I'm in trouble because she doesn't have her eye, eyes closed in any single picture that I could actually try to find. Uh, so I had a little bit of a difficulty with the eye, but I uh, managed to kind of just paint around it. This is my second layer, same colors, just adding a little bit more of that sepia color. And this is just to give a really nice tone. You know, what you see here is me going around where the shadow and casting the light I didn't want it to go over the light, which is very important, and you shouldn't do that. Although we're not here trying, like I said, to create perfection. As you see, if you really see, you really look at how I'm creating that work, is that I'm adding everything kind of just together, the shadow with the wa washes of paint. But one of the things that I actually, I can't seem to do in here, but I was actually rounding up the brush so i'm actually constructing that um basically this rounding up the subject as the chin area and all that stuff another thing that i noticed is that i did not went over my lights even though i try my best not to do it too obvious because it's also very important to not go over your lights we're not up here is but i feel like if you know the rules uh once you know the rules the basic rules and you'll be able to break them better and to feel better about what you create. And so that's what we're doing here. And you don't see my hand is because I'm all the way down in my painting and just doing all kinds of stuff. And I forget to move the camera. So I truly apologize for that. And I think I did it right at the last minute. There you go. So this phone stand is pretty far from the painting. And I didn't notice until I did this now and I'm looking at it. Uh, so what I'm doing here, you know, this is a watercolor and I also like to do that feeling of watercolor feeling into my paintings. So what I do is that I do purposely, I do that little, like, I don't know, like it's all over the place, watercolor type of thing. And I'm blowing as I go. So a lot of droplets of water on the corners and just blowing that up. You can do that with the straw, but I prefer just to do it by my own uh just the way i want to do it just i think i feel like i control it better and i and i just spread some watercolor all over and i just wanted to have that feeling of watercolor into my work i also uh did it <laughs> so now i'm just like i'm coming through my camera ah, sorry so we're just gonna zoom in I'm going back in and sitting down i think that's the best that's the difficult part Try to zoom in and doing everything with the phone, but it's working. We're just gonna leave it a chance. Just wanted to show you what I, how I did this, mm -hmm. and so um, I hope that you are able to grasp on how to do this. You really don't have to do that part, not necessarily. I just do it because I don't know. It just takes me away from perfectionism. And so that's what I'm doing. So now we're doing the lippy area. And for the lips, that's a rosy, same about the same contrast or the same uh, shadow color, just without the burnt sepia, of course, and no dark colors. And what I did is that I added to the lips. And I'm also rounding up the upper lip as well as the bottom part. Like I said, I kind of just omit where the light is hitting or I made my own light this big the picture does not have that but I wanted to incorporate that so I went around that and I created that almost like a cast bubble in um, in each uh, part of the lips so I could just go around it with the brush and not paint that part which I left white
so now this is my favorite part and I know it's not like the greatest maybe for some but I really like to do this I did some tears coming out of her eyes with water I thought also it will be really interesting I cast a bit of shadow underneath the bird because I thought you know a bird is on your eye why not just create a shadow I didn't want to do anything creepy or anything like that but I did um, create some tears and this is not easy to do you see me <laughs> going around there's tier number one and it's kind of like medium size bigger and longer kind of like thing um, and I did three tiers of her eyes which is pretty cool with watercolors and you can see it on the finish picture
so now we're basically just about to be done with the painting oh i did create the middle size or the left side of plant or the magnolia better say i started doing her middle side it's the only the only one that is actually looking at the viewer and this is this goes with the same principle you see that i said that i have one small one medium size on the top part and then you have the open one basically just showing everything so it's almost like a um, rule for me on doing my work and uh, that triangle triangular space that you see there as well everything has sort of like a bounce effect on this work and i think it works out perfectly and i really like it so that's what i'm doing is basically um just doing the middle part of the flower just creating also the veins of the magnolia and just adding a lot of uh, different details into the flower which i think is um, very beautiful in itself and so together with all of this i think it worked pretty well So before I go, and I just wanted to allow you to just look at the process without me talking, I think that this is uh, what I wanted to create since the get-go. Let me know if this painting is appealing to you, that you really actually learned something. I love it when people leave me messages or comments here. I know that it's not like the greatest when it comes to like the camera, it's not the greatest. I'm going to try to improve that. And uh, also, if you have any questions, you're more than welcome. I have, uh, this is my account for YouTube, but I definitely, like I said, I'm going to post where you can find me on Instagram and my other videos as well. And uh, what else I was going to say? That's it. I hope that you enjoy watching it and that you continue to enjoy uh, and also to share with those who like this type of work or the like art in general.